Okay, and I have another one. Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisance as all pleasure, Shri Prabhupada. Welcome devotees to our morning Bhagavatam class. This morning we'll be discussing from Canto 1, chapter 11, verse 15, and the chapter is entitled The Entrance of Lord Krishna into Dwarka, and the class will be given by His Holiness Chandramali Swami. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to you and all glories to Shri Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, my obeisances to you and my obeisances to all the devotees. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. And it's all yours, Maharaj. Okay, Srimad Bhagavatam 111.15. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Dwari Dwari Gwinanam Chaha Dadyak Sakta Palek Subihi Alankritam Punam Kumbayar Bali Beer Dupa Deepakai <laughs> In each and every door of the residential houses, auspicious things like curd, unbroken fruit, sugar cane, and full water pots with articles for worship, incense, and candles were all displayed. Report. The process of reception according to Vedic ritual rites is not at all dry. Reception was made not simply by decorating the roads and streets as mentioned above, by worshiping the Lord with requisite ingredients like incense, lamps, flowers, sweets, fruits, and other palatable edibles, According to one's capacity, all were offered to the Lord and the remnants of food steps were distributed among the gathering citizens. So it was not like a dry reception of these modern days. Each and every house was ready to receive the Lord in a similar way. And thus in each and every house on the roads and streets distribute such remnants of food to the citizens. And therefore the festival was successful. Without distribution of food, no function is complete. That is the way of Vedic culture. Om Vigyam Timiram Dasya Kena Jana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasma Shri Gadavena Maha Ma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Puchari Ne Nirvase Sasunyavadi so there's a nice comparison between what is real culture and what goes on as um, the remnants of a society that is focused not on the Lord, not on the individual's benefit, but on money. The present day society is simply situated on money. There's no culture. And all of the, what we say, arrangements for festivals and for other things are not being done anymore. People take holidays and perform festivals and they all do the same thing. They simply get intoxicated, sit around talking what they talk about, and uh, performing a few maybe sporting activities to keep the day moving. And that's about it. So even ordinary activities have become less ordinary by today's uh, society. 
Prabhupada was, uh, I was listening to Srila Prabhupada this morning. He was saying that uh, in Vedic culture, when one would appear in public, they would always, they would take a bath. They would um, decorate themselves very nicely with flowers and various types of ornaments, perfumes, various aromatic scents. And uh, then a person would appear in public. And then Prabhupada made a comparison to what is today's uh, society, which is that if you take a bath, then you're considered to be able to appear in public. And Prabhupada said, not even that is being done anymore. <laughs> he was saying that he was talking to his disciples, American disciples. This was a lecture in Los Angeles in 1972. And he's telling them that, you know, I came to your, your country and I can see no one follows any of the hygienic or etiquette that comes about when for social customs or religious principles, nothing is being followed anymore. And he used the example that nowadays people don't even take a bath. They wash once a week <laughs> at most. And Prabhupada was saying that even in some houses, there's not even a shower. You have to go to your friend's house who may have a bathroom and a shower and you can get cleaned up there and then go back to your house. So society claims to be advanced, but it's quite the opposite. In Vedic society, people ate on gold and silver plates with utensils of the same quality. But now it's plastic or paper, or even stuff that is not healthy, such as styrofoam. The society has gone to hell. <laughs> and um, no religious functions are being really done anymore. People go to church once a week. And that's it. If they have a religious festival, it's something that comes up once a year, or maybe twice a year. Where you see, Prabhupada tried to revive the Vedic culture within the, the uh, Western society, and he introduced a lot of the uh, externals of the Vedic culture, culture. Here it says that reception was not dry. If the Lord came or even the Lord's devotees would come, there would be a grand reception with maybe kirtan, and then offering nice, sweet, and palatable fruits and other nice edibles, flowers. Lamps were offered, incense. It's like in some places, when the sadhu comes, they wash his feet. They offer him archi, sweet words. And after all of that, then the sadhu is pleased by the reception and he, he gives some transcendental knowledge. So uh, Prabhupada made an attempt to put some culture in a place where there was simply decadence or ordinary activity. And here we see, um, it's, this, it's described in many of the different incidents, just like when Lord Ramachandra was getting married, the whole city of Ayodhya was performing a festival every minute. They were hanging barley corns outside of the windows and brass pots were decorating the house around the windows so people from the outside could also see. Lamps were there. And uh, there were marching bands and 
soldiers decorated in their uniforms, parading very much in cadence. So, uh, I mean, there's a little bit of that left now, but nobody really cares about it anymore. <laughs> it's pretty much lost. Now everyone's thinking, well, how much money can we make on this festival? How much money do we have to spend for the festival? <laughs> uh, will we be able to get enough donations to uh, cover the cost of the festival? <laughs> the Prabhupada says, um, because this society is situated on money only, money keeps it going. Soon, when the money runs out and the economics change, the whole society will collapse. And that's what's happening now, <laughs> especially in the United States. But that's another subject. Um, so here, again, things are done with auspiciousness, with grandeur, with devotion with nice decorations. And uh, the Vedic culture is considered to be human culture, whereas human culture means that for every function, there is a particular set of rituals that, that go with the function in order to give the function auspiciousness, attraction, and Success. It's like we, we have our initiation ceremony. The initiation ceremony is a it's one of the samskaras. There are 16 samskaras nowadays. Only 10 of them are, are being used at most, not even that, maybe five. And samskaras means different levels of purification that one has to achieve as they go from different stages in their life. The first samskara is Garbhadana samskara, where in order to bring in a saintly soul into the world, the husband and wife will go through the process of purification before the, the unity. And this, this brings about a proper consciousness or a transcendental consciousness wherein the act of uh, pregnation becomes a divine act and not something just to fulfill one's desires for physical enjoyment. That is completely pushed away when the Garbhadana Samskara is effectively executed. And then, then when the child on, on the seventh month the, the, I think it's even the fourth month and the seventh month, there is particular rituals for the blessing of the child while I'm still in the womb. On the seventh month, there's a grand celebration to give extra blessings, getting ready for the deliverance of the child. And then uh, if you read how when Krishna was born and and uh, in Vrindavan, how mm, so much arrangements, decorations, uh, entertainment, everything was there. And the, the mother who's going through the process of deliverance, she's feeling happy, she's feeling uh, cared for, she's feeling nourished. And then she's feeling happy. And because of that, then the delivery becomes a wonderful experience for the mother and not some, just some ritual where the doctors throw some ammonia and some, some uh, formaldehyde to purify the atmosphere. The mother's struggling to get the baby, get the baby out. Sometimes the mother has to go through a cesarean operation in order for the baby to come out and it's and it's very difficult and so birth in vedic culture 
was giving a lot of attention to the father, to the mother, to the child when it appears. And then it was celebration. As soon as the child appeared, there would be a celebration. And gifts would come from friends, from relatives, from people in general. And the, it would be a grand experience to bring a soul into the world to become Krishna conscious. Now that was Vedic culture. And even before that, going back, when, a, when a, woman, a, a husband and wife want to, they decide on having a child, Balpa said it's not a secret. They'll make announcements to their friends, to the relatives, to people in general. And now there will be an impregnation at this particular day, and there will be a little bit of a ceremony and blessings for the couple in order to have a successful pregnancy. As mentioned, Prabhupada writes about that in the Bhagavatam, that before uh, one actually engages in bringing about a child into the world, they must receive the blessings and the permission of their spiritual masters, both the husband and the wife. And then there would be an announcement, and then everyone would know now they're preparing for a child. So this is, uh, this is real culture. It's not, now we talk about family, but so we live in a society where family means husband, wife, and one or two children. And that's considered family. But Prabhupada was saying this morning, he was talking about that uh, in one lecture. He was saying family doesn't mean just husband and wife and a few children. It means the, the brothers are there, the cousins are there, the sisters, the relatives. Uh, it becomes, and they call it joint family, but it's extended family. It's more like a community where everyone supports each other in their particular role within the family. And in Vedic culture, the family was very strong. Nowadays, in uh, Western culture, there was one story, one, one boy, he was about five years old. And one day he saw this man in, in the house, never saw this man before. So he came to his mother, he said, who is that? Who is that man? And she said, well, that's your father. For five years, he never saw his father. Because his, when he was uh, sleeping, his father, uh, um, when he was, yeah, when he was sleeping, his father was home. And when he was awake, his father was working. So the boy never grew up, at least for the first five years, without any association or even recognizing that he had a father. <laughs> so this is, um, you know, and then of course, you know, the husband works, the wife works, the children, when they're very, very young, sometimes are put into daycare centers or given to the grandparents. And uh, the children are just excess burdens upon the family because the family needs to make money and the children are also required attention, so everything is difficult. So Prabhupada was also talking on this same lecture. He said, I was in New York and I met this one elderly lady and she had a grown up son. And I said to her, well, why don't you get your son married? And she responded, yes, he can get married if he can support a family. And Prabhupada was thinking, wow, supporting a family is such a difficult thing. <laughs> We're in Vedic culture. It's just natural. And uh, but nowadays, everything is based on money. Money, money, money. 
And because it's based on money, it's not based on any social, ecclesiastical, aesthetic, spiritual values. Money moves everything along. And therefore our society is somewhat dysfunctional because people are separated from each other and they're all centered around making money. I've seen, personally, I've seen relationships between husbands and wife become so strained simply because of the money issue. So we live in a very uh, crude society where going to work, driving your car fast 50 miles one way, 50 miles another way, going to the doctors, you have to drive 100 miles, <laughs> going on vacation, you'd be you drive for like 300 miles, or sometimes you take a plane for a thousand miles. So everything is so fast and so money oriented. And relationships are strained because the economic factor becomes the center of the relationship. How much can the wife produce? How much can the husband produce? How much can even the children produce? In some families, they send the children to work as early as they can because there's not enough money in the family. So money, and of course, Prabhupada would say money is the honey, but honey means that there's bees around honey. So there's a good chance that one will also feel the pain of such a focus, of keeping money as the focus. So that is, so these dry rituals, because nobody's interested in rituals anymore because it costs too much money. Better to spend your money for intoxication, for buying the latest electronic devices, for going, uh, going on a vacation and so you can sit in the sun and drink some beer and talk nonsense with your friends. <laughs> so this is, uh, we're living in a very dysfunctional society now and it's becoming more so. And people are becoming more and more unhappy because of that. So you see here, so welcoming the Lord, welcoming the Lord's devotees, or just performing a ceremony that is part of the rituals of life is so grand. Wants to, con to contribute something. And Prabhupada ends by saying, without the distribution of food, Prashadam and no function is complete. That is the way of Vedic culture. Distribution of foodstuffs are actually a culmination. I remember one time I was preaching in one area. It was in India also. And this devotee wanted to have regular programs, but it was difficult for him along with his wife to cook or even to get the money for the ingredients for cooking. So they just uh, they just had the program of Kirtan and Prabhachan with no Prashanam. And I saw how people were so eager to leave after that so they could go home and get something to eat. When people sit down at the end and, and take prashadam, the devotees associate together. And then the whole program culminates in such a nice, sweet, and friendly atmosphere. And everyone uh, gets the benefit of the mercy of Krishna prashadam. So this is Vedic culture. Uh, Srila Prabhupada said, I've come to turn this 
uh, Western society upside down and make a society based on spiritual values, moral principles, and Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada's vision for preaching was not simply relegated to giving philosophical classes or writing some books or even distributing the holy name. He wanted to turn the whole society towards the, simple, the principles of Vedic culture on all levels. And he gave the instructions. And in some cases, we are doing it. And in other cases, we still have a way to go. OK, so I'll stop there. I just wanted to hit on some of the externals is being mentioned here because I, the externals make life sweet. Thank you, Maharaj, for, for the class and thank you for um, addressing points as you mentioned that they're externals. Would like to ask devotees have any questions, any uh, clarification, any comments, you know, please do share where you can raise your hand so that we can call each one of you in order because we have about almost 30 participants. It's really, really, really nice. I'm gonna stop sharing. And if we, we can request devotees to please uh, turn on your video as Marge just always requests so that um, we can get each other's association via Zoom. <laughs> the best as we can. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maraj. Any questions from devotees? Maraj, I have a question. And, and the last line of the verse, Prabhupada used the word Vedic culture. And I have you know, come across situations where we t uh, devotees interchangeably use the word Vedic culture and Hindu culture. Can no, you, that's different. Can you please speak on that, Maraj, please? Well, Vedic culture is worldwide, where Hindu culture is designated in a certain geographical area. And so Vedic culture is the principles that govern the activities of the human being according to scripture. And that it means all activities so it transcends or it extends beyond a limited particular culture, such as Hindu culture or European culture, whatever culture you want to say. So Vedic culture can apply to all. Hindu culture is a geographical element. And uh, many of the remnants of the Vedic culture still exist within Hindu culture, such as, such as the language, for instance. The Vedic culture centers around Sanskrit, and many of the Hindi, Hindi words come from the Sanskrit language. <laughs> Um, and there are many other aspects of Thank so you. So that's Lord. why. Yes, my Prabhupada, please much. Go ahead. Prabhupada, to some degree, Prabhupada was successful in bringing Vedic culture to areas all around the world because he knew it didn't apply to a particular geographical section or a particular language either. It just so happens that Vedic culture was more or less coming from that area of the world as Krishna appears in that area of the world more than any other place around the world.
Thank you, Maraj. And Maraj, there's another uh, question piggybacking to that is, um, um, is yes. Is there anybody else that has questions? <laughs> yes, and I'm I, I'm waiting for questions. I'm I um that's why I asked mine, hoping that others will have some time to ask their question. Yeah, and the host is supposed to see if there's anybody else, and then she jumps in. <laughs> Maraj, you can go right ahead and call because my I'm just the servant. You can just jump right in, Maraj, and call on anyone you want. <laughs> and I will oh, zip. <laughs> I'm, I'm not the host. You are. <laughs> oh, no, uh, I, I'm, I'm teaching my devotees who do the host program on my Zoom call that they should have their questions ready, but only when there's nobody else to ask, then they can ask. <laughs> That's why I had mine ready, much, but I will wait. <laughs> I, I asked my first question, so I'm good. <laughs> okay, so you can get back at me. No, 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 much. No, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyone else has questions, please. Um, do jump right. Good on Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Sri Prabhupada. So the question you just answered was wonderful. It shed quite a bit of light on Hindu culture versus Vedic culture. You literally compared and contrasted it in a short period of time. Sometimes we um, have the feeling that some of those who are Indian bodied say that we were raised a certain way at home as Hindus. And so this is how we do things. And then you come to a place like the United States or to Europe or places outside India. And they have difficulty um, doing what Hita Prabhupada taught us to do because they said it in, it's different where they were raised. And that sometimes brings about uh, conflict. What's some of the best ways to kind of, especially management facing that kind of situation? What's some of the best well, I, ways? To do? I don't think we should get so much involved in that because if we try to change people's habits, as long as those habits are not reflective of the mode of ignorance and passion, if they're if they're still within the, the culture of human acceptability, then, then that's fine. Just like, uh, for instance, sleeping on the bed as opposed to sleeping on the floor, you know. So uh, generally in, <coughs> in India, people are used to accustomed to sleep on a little mat and bathe in the well outside. But Prabhupada didn't really push that as a way that we should follow. But he just kept the main principles foremost. All right, so as long as people's general uh, habits, which are pertaining to bodily maintenance and bodily uh, needs, you might say, are uh, not in not <laughs> in the lower modes of passion and ignorance, and that's fine. <coughs> okay, thank you, Mike. Yeah. For instance, Prabhupada would say, when Westerners come to India, they are accustomed to a little bit better material arrangements, so. Well, but so we should make that arrangements for the Western devotees because they're not accustomed to all of the uh, difficulties or hardships that are presented in India. <coughs> Marge, there's a question here by Arti, and she said, uh, please accept my humble obeisance as all goes to show proud, but uh, Marge, you mentioned that you need the blessing of your spiritual master to start a family. What yeah. if one of both of the spiritual masters of the couple are no longer on this planet? Who do the couple seek blessings permission from? 
from another senior uh, Vaishnava who's on the same level as their spiritual master. Uh, if you want a clarification on that statement, I can give you a verse. It's from the seventh canto, 12th chapter, verse number 11, I believe. And Prabhupada's purport indicates what I mentioned about permission. 12, 7, 12, 11, I think it is, yeah. Um, yeah, so going to another senior um, devotee who is, you might say, on the same level as one's spiritual master would be comparable to approaching one's spiritual master. We can do that also for other things, also not only for, uh, for you know, Garbhadhan Samskara. <coughs> Thank you. Is that okay, Archie? Yeah, thank you. Hare Krishna. You look like you're in the temple. Are you in the temple? No, I'm in the um, conservatory at home. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wait, space is behind you. Yeah. So parents house <laughs> just like I've been living in in uh, another flaw of western culture is the brooms if you try to sweep a floor with the brooms that they make in today's society you get lucky if you get all the dirt up. I mean, you really have to be lucky. Because if it doesn't, if you miss it because of the way the brooms are fashioned, and if you, and if it doesn't stick to the broom, or if you somehow don't miss it, then there's some success. I mean, it look, it look like Indian brooms. They're, they're, they're very practical, you know. You can get into the corners and you can shake them out really easy. All the dust comes off. Then you clean the room really nicely. <laughs> Otherwise, you just push the, you know, you push the, the dirt this way and that way. <laughs> and most of it gets stuck onto the broom. Then you have to try to clean the broom. And what's even worse is mopping the floor. They get these mops with these attachable mop sponges on the top and the pads, and you just push it over the floor. And when you're done and it dries, the dirt's still there. Where <laughs> you get down on the floor in your hands and knees. Prabhupada actually did that. When he was teaching devotees how to wash the floor, he said he got down and he demonstrated how to do it. When he was done, the whole floor was clean and dry at the same time. And the floor was nowadays they squish it in this in this dirty mop and pull that lever to squeeze it out. It doesn't squeeze out it completely. Swish it that way and this way. It looks good, <laughs> but nothing happens. <laughs> Any questions from devotees? Please uh, do uh, jump right in. I I was going to pick on uh, Mother Sri Devi because she always has nice questions, but I think she's having some connection oh wait she is online i don't know whether she has a question any questions from devotees and it doesn't have to be from this topic and anything that has been on your mind i'm sure Maharaj would be more than happy to you know ask there's a question that came in the chat Maharaj. um please accept my humble obeisances so god to show Prabhupada and to your lotus feet 
Please, nowadays, Garbhadan Samskara is hardly followed. What happened when it is not followed? It's, it's a gamble. <clears throat> and the soul can come in from any place then. The Garbhadan Samskara sanctifies the womb and allows for an enlightened or an elevated soul to come in. <clears throat> You'll see the example with DT, when DT wanted to, she was feeling attraction for her husband and she wanted to have relationship. He told her, it's not the time. This is the time where Lord Shiva is traveling with his ghosts. And it's not a time, but she was persistent and he was weak. He couldn't resist. And what was the example? Or what was the result was that two demons were born. The Prabhupada makes those points. Time and all the preparations have to be in line in order to create an ideal situation within the womb for a soul to enter. <laughs> and sometimes because they don't follow that, there's no, uh, there's no uh, pregnancy. <clears throat> or a lower personality will may enter. Can't happen. <clears throat> Thank you, Maharaj. Or you just get a kid that's really naughty and he just doesn't listen to you all the time. <laughs> I saw that one of my disciples, he didn't even know about this idea of asking the spiritual master. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. I hope that helped, Prema Mataji. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj, for explaining it. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Mother Sri Devi, go right ahead. Thank you, Ansuya. I don't think I can put on my camera, though. Please forgive me for that. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Guru Maharaj. Jai. Uh, Guru Maharaj, this point that you mentioned, how difficult life is today and how... Um, driven the culture is in terms of uh, economic money 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 it's right. all it is there's only one thing in life money that's all there's nothing else but then at what cost you know i mean what cost because the uh, when both husband and wife are going to work children are stressed everyone is stressed there's no help really in the home <laughs> then it's a uh, mix for a very uh, you know, very difficult time for everyone involved. So just wondering, what is the solution to help such people? Very culture. <laughs> if you want to put a Band-Aid on a cancer victim, you can do that. Or if you, somebody has cancer, you give them an aspirin. <laughs> <laughs> But In other words, say, it takes it takes a whole upheaval and a, a regeneration of the whole society. And Prabhupada, he he started that. He started schools for kids who were coolest. He uh, explained the whole importance of grihasta life and how grihastas should live as grihastas. He showed, you know, he explained that the importance of the values in life were not centered around economic gain, but on, on personal development. Hope that she helps. Looked, yeah, she looked well, but formula for Krishna consciousness is a, cre a complete overhauling of the whole 
Western society. Western society is just barbarians. That's all. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit more vocal today. <laughs> The barbarian culture. They use toilet paper. <laughs> That's really a hellish, you know. And people, you go to the bathroom and don't even bathe. <laughs> yeah, it says if, if you evacuate, you must take a shower afterwards. That all year round, not just. And then when the war, the weather is warm. Thank you, Marge. Um, Mother Namrata, please go with the question. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisance. Please all glorious special abode, but. Uh, Guru Maharaj, uh, I wanted to ask when a, a woman misses her pregnancy naturally, uh, uh, does she has to face uh, the same uh, reaction as that uh, when abortion is there? I, I, I guess I missed the first few words of your question. Uh, when a I'll say it again, Maharaj. Uh, when a per, uh, when a lady uh, when she misses her pregnancy, so does she have to face the same reaction as when it is uh, during the abortion time? That uh, when there is an abortion, does she has to face the same reaction when there is a natural uh, miscarriage or when she misses the pregnancy? No, <laughs> and that's that's under the laws of. Nature, it's under the laws of karma. No. <clears throat> you know, you're saying when there is a miscarriage, and uh, yeah. is it the same as an abortion? No. no. I mean, miscarriage is not something voluntary, it just happens by higher powers or by circumstance. Of course, to, in order to avoid that, just like in Vedic culture, when a woman gets pregnant, at least after a month or two, she is uh, she's basically in seclusion during that whole time. And she's cared for by friends and relatives, and she's given everything she needs to be comfortable. And so the child grows naturally. Nowadays, women, they go to work while they're pregnant. What the woman eats, I remember when we were in New Vrindavan when I first joined, we would, when we would serve out kitchri, the women who were pregnant would only have to eat kitchri with no spices. And because if it was spicy, it would be something that could cause distress upon the child. So she has to be in a, an environment where everything is nice and so the child grows nicely and happily while in the room because the child is alive at that time and the child picks up whatever the mother does mm -hmm. so but nowadays we don't follow that because Like in, like in the UK, I think in the UK, if a woman gets pregnant, I think they give her some months, I think towards the end of the pregnancy that she can uh, not go to work and get paid for, which is pretty good. But then when the child is born, if the woman has a job, if she doesn't go to work, then she loses her job. But that's the time when the child needs the mother the most. 
right after the birth. So everything is backwards, <laughs> upside down. Again, because again, our, this is the whole world's culture is situated on money. And these are not my words, these are Prabhupada's words. He said, because the whole world, everything is situated at money, it will collapse. It's not based on any human or spiritual values, just money. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, thank you. There's a question of raised hand, but I don't know the devotee's name, Prabhu. I apologize. You can ask your question, Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. First of all, our businesses. I have to turn off my camera because I'm driving. Okay. Uh, the question is, um, uh, we know that money um, have a great role in this world. Uh, we know that uh, ISKCON was uh, built on money. All the temples, uh, agriculture, uh, uh, communities, uh, so on. Uh, now I am living in the temple alone with uh, another refugees, one Grihaska family and one single Pradhu. Uh, they don't uh, walk in, they just live in the temple, uh, visiting programs, singing kirtans, so on. I am walking, uh, no, go for work, uh, earning money and donate money for temple needs. Also, I buy food, Koga. Uh, it's okay, but uh, some, this Grihaskas uh, began to criticize me that I'm buying a small, a small raisins or a small cereals because uh, big raisins are more tasty. I don't like this. I buy what I can. <laughs> You no, know, uh, I, I think that uh, is, this is not proper to criticize. What, can you mm, explain the situation? That's a, that's a local oh. problem. Yeah, that's just a local problem. Okay. You just have to work it out. That's just a local problem, that's all. I can't give any. I can't give any solution or any suggestions. It's just a local problem. That's all. Uh, what kind of money was in the Vedic times? Coins, uh, golden bars, uh, so on. What kind of money was in Vedic, the Vedic times? Yes, coins, yeah, yeah. golden yeah. bars, gold, gold coins, gold coins. Gold and okay. silver coins. Yeah, money is precious metals, not this paper. This paper is just what it is paper. <laughs> if the government falls, you just take your paper and you can make a wall with all the different presidents on it. <laughs> And all the guys that were fought in the war, whose picture they slap on this piece of paper, you know, <laughs> you don't even know who he is. <laughs> Nobody cares either. <laughs> this paper. Prabhupada talked to he talks about that. He also said the fall of the Western civilization means the the collapse of the whole economy. And he said, your your paper will be worth zero. <laughs> Right now, there, there's a there's a program to digital digital digitalize digitalize the entire economic situation worldwide. They want to get rid of paper money around the world now. So there's a program. They're actually experimenting in certain places now with digital currency. It's already happening in some places, but they want to make it complete that everything is done by electronics, you buy everything through the media. 
you spend through the media, you earn through the media, everything. And that's 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 a program. It's happening. <laughs> So Prabhupada say your money is yeah. So if you got any paper money hanging around, you better use it before you before you, it's gonna be. So my suggestion is you know buy some farms and get some cows, get some land, grow some agriculture and some grains, live simply. One of my god brothers, his name is Daneshwar, and he wrote a whole book called Spiritual Economics. Really interesting presentation. He wrote the book about 20 years ago, maybe even more. Spiritual economics means it has to be based on a more of a communal society and not this particular society. So the farm communities and rural life are more, uh, are actually conducive to that type of lifestyle. Where people share labor and share resources. If you have a skill, then you contribute to the community with that skill. Someone else has another skill, they do that. And if you have excess of any kind of foodstuffs or anything, you give that and you can trade with someone who has excess of something else you may need. So trading, bartering, uh, sharing. That's faded culture. And of course, gold coins were used for, for, you know, for transactions also. But now there's no gold coins available. You have to buy gold. It's like ridiculous. It's hard to find anyway. Silver. So everybody's poor. If you want to hear a lecture, just listen to Srila Prabhupada. Make a note of this one. It's uh, December 31st, 1973. Morning walk conversation with devotees in Los Angeles. The Papa talks about the whole idea of currency. It's really interesting. The whole the whole lecture is on currency. 1973, December 31st, morning walk, Los Angeles. Thank you, Marge. Well, that's a question from Mother Prema. She says, can you kindly elaborate what happens when a lady aborts a child? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. You mean, what is the reaction for that? Is that what she's asking? Yes, what, is yes. the, what is the please, reaction? Yes, please. What happened? You know, like any karmic reaction? Because oh, I know. Yeah. yeah, heavy karmic reaction. Very heavy. Life, life is given by God, and life is taken by God. We have no right to destroy life. Is that life, anything? Life is under the hands of the Supreme Lord directly. He gives life, and he also takes life through the material energy. So anyone... We are simply instruments in bringing life into the world. We don't, we don't produce life. So anyone who destroys life uh, will have to suffer accordingly. That child was placed in the womb by the Supreme Lord for that child to live out its life and to grow and work out its karma and eventually come to Krishna consciousness. And so we interfere with that at the same time. So the best prevention in order to avoid uh, these situations where it becomes a problem, like I don't want to have a child, I can't afford to have a child, I can't afford to take care of a child, but still the child's coming is to follow the Vedic culture and uh, to restrict, you know, 
physical activity to a certain system of principles that is given by Srila Prabhupada, he explains. So procreation is, uh, sex life is meant for procreation, not for recreation. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. And Maharaj, there's a question from Namrata. She said, is the barter system a better idea than the currency, than the currency trading? Uh, currency trading? You mean paper trading? Well, you, I mean, you have to change the whole economic structure of the society in order to do that. But that's, that's the Vedic culture, how it was set up. Now we have a whole different setup and culture. You can't actually do the, the trading. I mean, you can you can do it to some degree, but it will not not extend itself beyond a certain point. And so people still do that. I got something excess excess that you need, and you have something excess that I need, so we trade. People can do that, and they still do that in some certain certain areas. But that's usually done with farmers. They have extra grain or the extra vegetables and like that. Or, you know, you have some skills that I need and you, 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 you come and give you, offer your skills and, and I, uh, I reciprocate in some way. So it's a more personal culture. It's a more spiritual based culture. Now everything yeah. now everything's done by the profit margin. So Maharaj, in, in the history, uh, there are some civilizations which were based on barter system and which were quite successful but collapsed uh, somehow. So that is why this question was raised in my mind. Yeah, um, the reason it collapse is interference from outside, <laughs> generally. Like India was fine until the, United, until the West introduced television. Now it's gone to hell. It's going, India is going through a certain karmic period where they have they're getting their they're getting the benefits of their previous pious activities in the form of material amenities and material gain. But as it's explained in the Bhagavatam, these things are meant for devotional life and not for sense enjoyment. Because they, they consider, they've been the propaganda is that to enjoy this material world and to practice spiritual life is you can't do that. So you, you should push away your spiritual life. And for so many millenniums or so many hundreds of years, You've been in the dark ages just, just worshiping God. Now come out and you know get the latest fashions, get the latest uh, cars, you know. I remember when I first went to India, the only car I ever saw on the road was an ambassador. <laughs> These big tanks, you know. <laughs> the British introduced those things. Now everybody's got modern cars. And every modern car has a scratch and a dent in it because <laughs> Prabhupada strongly said, he said, he said, India is not meant for material advancement. The culture, the environment, the people, 
tradition is not suited for material advancement. That's why the Indians come to the West because they can do it with no problem. When they try to do it in India, they're doing it, but it looks really weird and <laughs> strange. <laughs> So you have to understand Indian. India's culture is spiritual. Marshi, that, that was a powerful statement because, you know, uh, you know, if because India is not, you know, is not meant for material advancement, as Sri Prabhupada said. And people try their best to make it materially advanced, but still there's 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 a lack of satisfaction. So they come to America but and do it. Some of the high one of the highest rates of heart attack is in the coming in around the world is from India. The most deaths by car accidents now are India. It's a fact. That is wow. Yeah, I remember my uh, my mother uh, when we were visiting. This is like before I even became a devotee when I was a kid. This was in the early late seventies, early eighties when we were visiting India because my dad had a job there, and the traffic was horrendous. <laughs> My mom used to say that she had to hold a heart in her hand just to cross the street. <laughs> yeah, the Russians said the same thing when they tried to bring communism into Russia. And they were also teaching atheism. But then the communists were saying, there must be a God in control because it's not possible to drive like this. You know? <laughs> Friendly. I just when I go to India now, I I stop freaking out anymore. I just I just watch and it's kind of funny. It's like watching a like one of these Charlie Chaplin movies or something. <laughs> I think I I think Sri Devi had her hand up just now. I I think she had a question. Sri Devi, do you have a question? Because I think you had a hand up just now. She, I, I got to tell you, I, you, you, you've heard of the, <clears throat> the air pollution index reading. You've heard of that? They keep, um, there's like a meter for measuring air pollution. <clears throat> a couple years, well, you know, they can measure the smog and the, and so there's like a, just like we measure temperature with barometers and temperature gauges. So there's, a, there's machines for measuring air pollution index. So I was talking to one devotee in Mumbai and uh, the air pollution index should be about 10 or 20, that's normal. But if it gets about a hundred, it's considered to be quite, you know, severe. So I asked this devotee, and he was telling me the air pollution index is 500 and something in Bombay. It was so bad, and I was there too, that the sun was out, but the sun had a, a hazy cloud in front of it, and it was just the pollution. There was no clouds, it was just pollution. Delhi is, Delhi is the worst city, one of the worst cities in the world. This lockdown that we had in 2020 saved many cities from going to hell because that's, that stopped all of that traffic for a while. And the cities cleared up and there were reports saying that now we can see the mountains. We couldn't even see the mountains behind, you know, because in Delhi you can see the, you can see the Himalayas there. You couldn't even see it. 
So yeah, air pollution index. And it says living in Bombay is like smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. That's that's pretty intense, Maharaj. My God. My mom Ratha, she's smiling because she lives in Bombay. <laughs> uh, Maharaj, I've heard about this uh, index. Actually, it, it, the the ideal level is around fifty, and uh, yes, Mumbai is definitely worse. Uh, I mean, not not good. It's it's bad, but Delhi is at really bad condition. It, I think Delhi is like around 500 or more than that so it's it's really bad in delhi yeah yeah well uh, when i was in delhi i was staying at one devotee's house and they have a little they have a daughter and she's around 14 at the time so it was in the middle of the week and so i said you're not going to school today are you? she said no they called off school for the next two days because the pollution is so bad <laughs> They had to shut the schools because of the pollution. Yes, Guru Maharaj, the uh, government has uh, taken very strict steps against this. And, and definitely lockdown has helped. But yes, Delhi has uh, been facing these issues. And even uh, the, there was a ban for, you know, oiling lamps also during the Diwali. And so there were crackers are like far away. But even oil oil lamps were restricted in Delhi. The lamps are not doing it. It's the it's the smog from the cars, trucks and the cars. But they won't they won't stop that. They'll let it keep going and they're trying to try to adjust it. So some of the plan makers are thinking that one day we'll. Um, just like in, I remember when I was in Delhi, it depends on your license plate. Uh, if your license plate ends with a, an odd number, you can drive your car on certain days. And if it ends with an even number, you can drive your car on the other days. Yeah, that's how they were trying to monitor the traffic. So if you had an odd number of car and you were driving on an even day and the police saw you, you, you could get you could get a fine. So they're trying to do it in an artificial way, but it will. It, it can't work that way. You have to change the whole lifestyle, the way people live. So the Vedic culture is still strong in the villages. In many places, but the cities are finished. Mars, there's one comment and one question here in the chat. The comment is from Dear Krishna. He says, Hare Krishna, anyone looking for the proof of existence of God? Yes, drive or get driven by in India. That's <laughs> what he said. And um, uh, a question from Sri Devi. She's having Wi-Fi, a bad Wi-Fi a problem today. She said, um, what are the reactions when a wife or daughter-in-law is forced to abort by the husband or in-laws? Heavy. <laughs> yeah, it says that one who... Uh, I guess like there was one doctor in uh, Mumbai. I met him and he had performed 35,000 abortions when I, I was, yeah. He came to Krishna consciousness and, and, uh, and he's giving so many reasons why he had to do it, you know, because women were getting raped and now they have a child that they didn't want, and so and they couldn't really take care of it. So he was saying in order to, you know, show compassion to these women who were victimized, you know, we have to take, we do these abortions. But there's other alternatives too. So, um, yeah, because it says, 
And I remember that devotee, that devotee, I mean, nobody wanted to give him initiations because they were thinking what kind of karma we're going to get if we give him initiations. <laughs> so all of the senior devotees were like running away, you know, it's like heavy, you know. <laughs> he was a nice guy. He was, and we would talk together, but he still, would, he still wouldn't give up his practice. Um, yeah, so it explains that if one is involved in abortion, then in one of their next lives, they also have to uh, enter into the womb and be aborted also. Yeah, now Prabhupada talks about that. Because life starts with conception. Contrary to what the doctors say, that life starts on the so at a certain month during pregnancy is all is all bullshit. Because how is a child growing if there's no life there? <laughs> That's stupid. That's just their their way of uh, their, their way of uh, you know sanctioning these abortions. So Marge, is did that devotee ever get initiated? That is really sad. I mean, I feel so bad. So I bad. lost contact with him after some time. He might still be floating around somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> 35,000, that's intense karma. Hare Krishna. Well, that was that was about 10 years ago, or maybe more. It seemed, so I don't know what the situation is now. Wow. Marge, um, it's almost 8.30 here. I was wondering if you, I, I, if there are any questions, you can jump right in devotees and in the next couple of minutes. And Marge, if you would like, I think it's close to your lunchtime, right, Marge? Um, yeah, that's part of today's program, yeah. <laughs> 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 Mark, would you like to end the class and have your lunch, or would you like to chant and end and have your lunch? It's your call, Marge. Um, well, I got up at 2.30 this morning, so the only way I could chant my rounds this morning is I had to keep walking, <laughs> so I was pretty tired. Marge, then we will end the class. Completely understandable, Marge. No problem you, at all. If you want, I can walk back and forth in front of the computer. <laughs> Devotees would love to have your direct association, Marge. I don't want to put you in any inconvenience, Marge, really. But my humble request, Marge, is when you're coming to America. Um, I fly into Chicago on the 12th of July. Okay. And then I go to Toronto Rathiatra after that, and I return to Chicago. Chicago's doing their Rathiatra on the 23rd of July, I think. Okay. At least they're trying for it. And then uh, after that, I have no, you know, uh, written schedule. But, but you said you had to come to Pennsylvania for, for doctor's checkup, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now, I'm pretty healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so, Martin. <laughs> well, you know, just for routine. <laughs> okay. Marsh, when I'll, you're in the country, would I'll, love to have your association. I'll, I'll come visit. and visit you as long as I can now. Uh, as long as I can do it, go to a program at Dear Krishna's house. If I can go to Dear Krishna's house, then Dear I... Dear Krishna is online. He... That was one of the nicest programs I can remember. All the best to you, Professor Prabhupada. Yes, Maharaj, we are eagerly waiting, Maharaj. Okay. So I'll be there. I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the U.S. For, for a month, from the 12th of July to the 16th of August. Maharaj, I will email you and we will humbly request you to give us your mercy in, Pen in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Somewhere oh. in the schedule. Okay. You got me. 
<laughs> Thank you I, so much, Maharaj. I'll come and try to serve the devotees. We want to serve you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. I'll ask Prisha to make you your, your favorite bread. Will that help? Um, uh, there's some variations since the last year. So, so but Prixit's bread is so good that can't turn it down. <laughs> He's the best. So far, I haven't met anybody who can make bread like him. It's, it's, just, it's like an experience. We're at your service, Mike. Uh, well, put me down for a loaf. <laughs> you got it, Maharaj. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Since I'm in the category, since I'm like in the category of loafers, I should, I should get a loaf. <laughs> thank you so much, Marge. And you want to thank all the devotees for joining us for this. Wait, there's something in the chat. I just it just popped up. Um, what's it saying? Oh, one it devotee says, uh, t "Tell tell Maharaj to, to get off the computer." That's what it says. No, 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 Marge, not at all. They were enjoying the conversation. Thank you so much, Marge. <laughs> Thank you to all the devotees for joining us. Vancha Kapri Vyascha, Kripa Sindhu Evacha, Patitanam Pavanavya, Vaishnavavya, Namona, Prabhupad, Ki Jai. Jai. Chandramani Swami, Ki Jai. Jai.